Hi, online people. <clears throat> I am uh, greeting you week six. Can you believe it? The semester is just whipping by. And uh, I always like to greet a class, even if it's, a, uh, you're not imaginary. You're just, you're just out there. Um, I always like to begin class holding a beautiful book of poetry, and I have so many. I have way more than I deserve. And this one is by uh, Jane Kenyon. It's called Let Evening Come. It's her collected poems, and that means uh, she's sleeping in the earth. She was the uh, husband of Donald Hall. Every English major knows, well, poetry uh, enthusiasts will know that uh, Jane Kenyon and Donald Hall, for a long time, they were like the poet laureates of New Hampshire. They took care of each other in this drafty farmhouse, and everybody, they, they both were sick. Um, and um, everybody thought that Donald Hall would die first, but Jane Kenyon went hither first, and uh, they really loved each other. It's a super short poem, so don't worry. If you're not a poetry fan, you'll be happier today. Um, also want to say uh, something about the apocalypse. Hope you don't mind. And um, I'd like to make, uh, tomorrow's Valentine's Day, and I was making it clear to all my students in my live classes today that even though the scarf that I was wearing has a little heart on it uh, that my wife put there when she made that scarf for me a few years ago, I, I wanted my students to know that that wasn't a, you know, the pro proverbial ringing endorsement of Valentine's Day. And I'll explain why it was an endorsement of it. It won't take very long to talk about that. And it's it's, it's kind of not, not an English class idea. But I want to put before you an idea um, that I uh, talk about sometimes when Valentine's Day is here or since I have so many high school students when prom is coming or um, homecoming, which usually happens in the fall. And it's an idea that I think is, um, some students last year were, were um, really enchanted by it. And I, I would call it important. And then I'm going to pretty much put one style lesson before you uh, today. Not everything can be replicated that I do in a live class online, but I can at least talk about it. And it has to do with an activity that I'm going to do with my Staples kids tomorrow when I get up to Staples Motley High School. Cute little school, cute little town, and um, I'll explain that when I, when, I, when I get there. And I hope this sounds like a day to you. I'm, right, I'm still previewing two minutes in. Uh, Jane Kenyon. I have a feeling this poem is about her husband. The Shirt. The shirt touches his neck and smooths over his back. It slides down his sides. It even goes down below his belt, down into his pants. Lucky shirt. I've been, uh, I don't think I had the right intonation on that last line. It should have been lucky shirt. Yeah, I'll read that better when I scandalize students with that uh, later. So. Um, you know, I'm, uh, the apocalypse is in mind because I'm, I, I think apocalyptically. It's the way my head is wired. And partly, too, I can't remember if I mentioned this to you, with my humanites, um, Planet of the Humanites, I, as I call it, my humanities class, 27 wonderful students in there, and we're um, just doing a, a brief thematic unit, putting in collision different sacred texts from different traditions. So we read uh, the first few, uh, first eight books from Genesis at the beginning of the Bible from the Hebrew tradition. Uh, for class today, we read the book of Revelation, which we all kind of got freaked out by. That's the last book of the Bible, 73, written by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos during the reign of Nero, the only apostle that lived. And Wednesday, I'm kind of hanging on to my hats because we, I gave them uh, some excerpts from uh, the Holy Quran, which is uh, what our brothers and sisters who are Muslim uh, ascend to world, worldwide. And so my thinking is just a, a little bit apocalyptic, and, and I'll just put it, put it this way. Um, before the world changed, um, I told students that the fact that I heard that, that Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones stopped drinking, I thought, that's, that's, the be that's the end of the world. I mean, that's the beginning of the apocalypse. And pretty much after he quit drinking and smoking, um, the, it, everything began. Uh, but then last fall, something even m more dramatic happened. I think it's written in the Bible somewhere, a line where Jesus goes, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, you will see signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and know then that my return is not far away, is near. So uh, how's this for uh, sun, moon, and star stuff? This is a photograph that was taken, uh, taken of our sun last fall. Behold, look it. Okay. 
that's freaky, man. That's our son. And I know you're thinking Teletubby. I'm thinking, I'm thinking that that is actually the son somehow <clears throat> intuitively imitating the most horrific monster Hollywood has ever produced, which everyone knows is the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters 1. And um, let me get a little bit more serious. Um, to repeat an idea that, I'm, that I've repeated to all three of my live classes tomorrow, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow when I get up to Staples because it's Valentine's Day and not the greatest day to be teaching in a high school. Halloween's worse, but Valentine's Day is not much better because mainly because kids eat sugar until they're just out of their minds, and they'll be out of their minds by the time I get there too, or tired from eating all the sugar. Um, sim I simply want to say this. If you teach long enough, you can see thought, and in particular, I've... Uh, acquired the superpower of being able to see suffering. And I have for 36 years seen tears on Valentine's Day. Because if you don't have a Valentine, it can make you feel out of it, right? You're, like, you're, like you're just not with it. And I, I, I simply want to say, um, I'm, not, I'm not totally shaking my fist at the holiday. Uh, was it something that Hallmark created as a crass money grab uh, for the you know, greeting card industry? I have no idea. Um, but I know that an awful lot of money is going to be spent uh, tomorrow on flowers, and some of that money, a little bit of it's going to be mine, because I, I love my wife, and I'll, I'll go get her flowers. But I, what I don't like about the day is how inadequate and alone and it, it makes people feel. I'm also unhappy about the idea that the day can make love and romance uh, almost uh, come across as synonyms when, when they're not. Romance only lasts a little while. Love lasts forever, if you, you know, if you got your heart right about it. And um, don't, don't, don't let tomorrow put you down. It'll come along if it hasn't found you yet. Uh, the stage manager in Thornton Wilder's Our Town says we go off two by two. He also says elsewhere in the play, everybody climbs into their grave married. And uh, that'll be most of us and um, mo most of you. So, uh, oh, and I, for years I've been telling the story wrong. I had the idea in my head that there was a Saint Valentine that was like secretly marrying people back when they were burning Christians and throwing them to lions. It actually begins with an English poet named Geoffrey Chaucer. A little history here for you. He wrote something in the late 1300s called The Parliament of Fowls, F-O-W-L-E-S. Fowles is how that's pronounced in Middle English. And um, it's, it's basically a story about a guy who's trying to read Scipio's um, dream, uh, Somniferum Scipionis. But the poet falls asleep because it's kind of boring. And while he falls asleep, he begins to dream of a spring day, early spring day, where all the birds of the forest get together to try to pick out mates. And um, that, that's, that's actually right shortly after that is when um, the greeting, the, the idea of writing cards and signing it, your Valentine, so and so, began. So let's, and I'm, I'm even happier with that because it, we can credit um, poetry uh, with uh, giving us a day that um, is wonderful and confusing and hurtful at the same time. Now, here's one of the more important stories I'm going to tell you to try to make a point. Um, oh, this is going to look stupid. See these little dots? I don't know if you can see these dots. What, what, what the world tries to convince us, and culture is very powerful with music and movies, um, what the world tries to convince us is that you're going to have these moments in your life that are going to be like the biggest moments ever, and they're going to happen. Yeah, it was a big day when I got married. It was a big day when I became a father and then became a father again. And big days can be horrible too, like the first time I found out I had cancer and needed surgery. My argument is, is this, and it's kind of a stolen idea. I steal it from a poet named Robert Creeley, and I better try to find that poem. I think, yes, you're going to have big moments. Prom, maybe. Um, getting married, probably. But I have, for a number of years, only lately, recently, have I come to the conclusion that the biggest moments in your life come between the moments. The biggest moments that you, you, you and you're not going to see them coming. You won't see the biggest moments coming because they come not when the world prophecies that they'll come or, or forces you to think that they'll come because of culture. They come at you out of nowhere, surprisingly, between the moments. Now hang on to that for a thought and I'll, I'll tell you a real quick story about the greatest moment of my life as a teacher. And, and, and I will teach you something about writing if you stick with me. And I'm nine minutes in and I haven't told this story yet. 
so a long time ago, uh, uh, during the aughts, yeah, during the aughts, maybe 2004 or so, um, a woman came into my old ancestral office with her son at the beginning of the school year. He was a ninth grader. His name was Ruffin. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, why are you here? I don't teach ninth graders. Well, she was there because he wanted to be involved with my cross-country team. I was the worst cross-country coach forever, for 19 years. And um, I could see that he was a little bit of a different cat. Um, I, could, I, you know, just, I could read him at a glance. And she also let me know, Ruffin let me know that he had, he had bad knees. So I'm like, okay, why, how can you join the cross-country team if you have bad knees? Well, he wanted some kind of involvement, but I, he also let me know a couple of things right away. He, he was into gadgets. He had a backpack full of stuff, including walkie-talkies. And he also let me know that he liked to bike. He could bike. So right then and there, I created a job for him that lasted for four years. I decided that he would be the bicycle guardian. He would, you know, I would uh, meet, my teams would meet, I'd send them off running in the woods or wherever and whatever route, and Ruffin would sort of ride along with them and uh, let me know. I would go back to my office and do schoolwork. Worst coach ever. And every once in a while, the, the walkie-talkie would crackle and he'd give me a little report on how things are doing. And this was important, for instance, to give you an example, the day that apparently Tom Johannes was going to lead a bunch of boys to see if, what would happen if they peed on an electric fence. So I was like, oh, I had to get my truck and run out there and go yell at them, tell them not to do it. Bad idea. So um, here's the other thing I learned that day uh, about Ruffin. And I learned more about this from the American poet Jory, Jory Graham, who was friends with Ruffin's mother. Ruffin uh, was in that autistic spe spectrum in a big way. And Mary Jane White was told when he was a very, very little boy that she would need millions and millions of dollars because he was going to be in institutions for the rest of his life. Facilities, right? Group homes, whatever. And her thought was, this is the kind of lawyer that can take down countries. Mary Jane White said to herself, that's not what happens next. She promptly sued the Iowa School District where, where Ruffin was uh, um, uh, about to go to make sure that he would get help. She found out who the greatest autism experts were in the entire country, and she started flying in him and his grad students. Every single weekend, she fried her retirement, she trashed stocks, I mean, she just, she just went for it. She threw everything into this child. And their first uh, mission with him, he, who couldn't he couldn't talk at the time, was to learn the difference between a door and a window. If you're drastically autistic, you don't know the difference. And the most amazing story I heard about Ruffin's early childhood was she would, he, he would run in patterns, right, and make the same sound each point in the room. Um, autistic people need patterns, and that's exactly how God made them. They're perfect the way they are. We all are. And she would fling herself down on the couch and have to sleep once in a while. And many days she would wake up and find that Ruffin had taken string and measured out string so he could stand in the kitchen and pull the string and open up every single cupboard and closet door in that kitchen. He wanted to open each door simultaneously. And then he would go shut them all and then do it again. And shut them all and do it again. That's the mind of a future engineer. She told me the following year, when he was my student, she said, <clears throat> if he ever smiles, I want you to uh, write me an email. If he ever laughs, I want you to call me. I don't remember, I'd be lying if I told you what he smiled over, but it was in my old office, and it was just a little smile. And a couple months after that, and I went, wow, he just smiled. I just saw him smile for the first time. And a, a couple, uh, couple months after that, this kid named Max Lieberman came up to me and said, would, would you teach American Light in a banana suit to, this afternoon? I said, absolutely. Just bring a costume and install it on me. And it was so comfy. Uh, I just, I, I, I forgot that I had it on, kind of. And I taught a class with it, and I left my office open. There were kids in there talking and playing guitars and on computers. And when I got back to my classroom, to my office door rather, my old ancestral office, when I got to the doorway, uh, Ruffin looked up and laughed out loud. And uh, I, I, uh, call, I called his mother uh, immediately. That was news. That was the biggest, that's the greatest thing I've ever accomplished as a teacher. That was it, and I never saw the moment coming. I've been, you know, CLC Teacher of the Year, Faculty of the Year. I've been, I've been on stages where people were cheering me because of the poets that I brought. 
Um, I've, I've had more applause and accolades than, than I, way more than I deserve, and it hasn't done me any good. My greatest moment came uh, that day, and it'll never be topped. And it had nothing to do with English teaching, because school is a social adventure before it's academic. Every seasoned teacher knows that. I'm almost done with this segment. One more idea. Bode says, my hero Bode says, that many men, and I mean, when I say mankind, I mean everybody, many men have a moment. People, let's make it gender inclusive, sorry. Everyone has a moment in their life where they realize exactly who and what they are. His example is Judas, who realized when he kissed Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and betrayed him, he thought to himself, my God, my God, I really am a traitor. And the moment I realized uh, who and what I was uh, was when I stood there thinking, this is, the, this is the meaning of my life. I'm an English major in a banana suit, and I just made an autistic kid laugh. Now, on to the next thing. i got to teach you something about writing. I hope you enjoyed the last 16 minutes. You deserve to learn something about English. Um, about writing. And I'm just going to explain it. And we'll keep this under 20, 22 minutes, I think. We'll see, we'll see. Um, what I'm going to do tomorrow in Staples is something we really can't do online, but I can explain it and you'll get it. I'm going to ask for uh, four or five students to volunteer to come to the board. Now, I love doing this in my classroom because I've got the biggest chalkboard in the world, and every fall I send students to the board and I give them a piece of chalk, which is way better than a whiteboard. But tomorrow, I'm going to be dealing with kind of a scrunchy whiteboard that doesn't have a lot of room because there's one of those smart boards in the middle. And I don't, I like those because, um, for one thing, because when you show video, there's no sound, there's no fan noise like there is in my ancestral cl my classroom at, C at CLC. So I'm going to send them to the board and I'm going to say, okay, um, okay, you're my contestants, but there's no door prize. Here's what I'd like you to do. Would you, and it's, it was snow days up there last week. So I'm going to say to them, write one sentence about snow days. One. Um, you can, it can be any length. Just write a sentence of, of snow days. As long as snow days is in the sentence somewhere, I'll, I'll be happy. Uh, so in their defense, they're going to be a little bit nervous, but they know each other so well, so there's nowhere near as nervous, much nervousness going on as when I do this in the fall. But they're going to start writing, and they're going to be concentrating on writing a sentence that works. And here's what's going to happen. You can send nine... You can send 100 kids. It doesn't matter what level school. You could do this at Harvard. I've done it at St. John's. I've done it at St. Ben's. I've done it at my old high school. I've done it at St. Cloud State. You send some bright students to the board and tell them to write a sentence. What's going to happen is this. They're going to load the noun cluster into the front of the sentence. I'm not a grammarian. I, I, do, I dabble in it, okay? I know enough about grammar just to be dangerous. But w when they get the sentence done, I bet, I bet snow days is loaded into the front, and it's going to follow a pattern that is noun cluster, verb cluster. And I'll, I'll say what I say every year. I'll say, okay, you guys are good students, and you've been good students for years. And when you were little, and I bet you were cute, your teachers taught you that you should write with nouns and verbs. A sentence has to have some kind of subject, and then something has to happen to it. This is about as practical as I ever get. But the, the thing is, they've been... Um, you, they've been creating those sentences for so many years that you can fall into a habit of stylistically, this is a style thing, beginning too many sentences in a row with the noun cluster, verb cluster pattern. Any part of speech can get a sentence going. You can begin it with an adjective. You can begin it with an adverb, like slowly walking to uh, uh, snow days. You can begin it with a uh, 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 preposition. Uh, you can begin it... Um, any, anyway, like with a gerund or a participial, though I even, don't even know the difference. Those are words that have ing endings to create ongoing action. Running towards snow days, uh, dot, 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 etc. So thing one in this lesson, which I would call important, is that any part of speech can get a sentence going. And if you, if you, and this is not something to worry about while you're writing, but if you run eight, nine, ten sentences in a row, beginning with noun clusters, it can kind of wear your reader out. So that's a thing to check out in revision, which is something I don't do a lot of teaching of. I'd rather read a new paper um, than a revised paper. 
Um, and that's kind of a, a point of uh, some, we have a little bit of disagreement with that uh, with, the, with other English teachers. So I have colleagues who are, are really into teaching revision, and I applaud that. We're all doing things differently. So, so that's thing one. I also have the prediction tomorrow that not, not only will every sentence begin with a noun cluster, they will all have one level of generality, mostly. Now, generally, what students are able to do is hook a comma up medially and then create a, you know, a two-level sentence. After that, it can get to be a high-wire act. My lesson, this lesson, is not about creating long sentences. I like short sentences. I like medium sentences. I like long sentences. But sometimes you might need a more complicated structure to convey a simple idea. We will come back to this when we study the complexities of the difference between Ernest Hemingway sentences and William Faulkner between periodic sentences and sentences that are accumulative. So to help them get this, I tell them a story, and it's the last story I'm gonna, it's, it'll end this video for you. When my, when my big boy was little, I love this story. I tell, this is one I tell every comp one. I would, I'd come home every day, and it always seemed like he was eating. He was always in his high chair, stuffing his face with something, and he got fat. Both the boys got fat on, on breast milk. Holy cow, it was like picking up a bag of cement. And he's sitting in, every day he was sitting in the chair eating Cheerios, he'd have pesto rubbed all over his little bowling ball head. And there was a number of weeks, um, I don't know what year, it doesn't matter, he was in a high chair, so you can, you know, he's two maybe. And I'd come home every day, he could barely speak. I'd come home every day and I'd say, hey Jeffy, hey little man of mine, what are you doing? Every day, for some weeks, this went on for some, some time, he'd say, I'm eating, I'm eating, I'm eating. Hey, Jeffy, what are you up to? I'm eating. Hey, little dude, what are you up to? I'm eating. Hey, little guy, what, what, what are you up to? What's going on today? I'm eating. And then there was a day where I came flying in, you know, I was young, and we were all young. And I said, as I said, I was about to say, well, Jeffy, what are you doing? You guys, I swear I heard a celestial choir. Lord, I thought I heard music coming from heaven. The shaft of sunlight already in the kitchen got a little bit brighter. And Jeffy said, I'm eating. And then he picked up a sippy cup and said, and drinking juice. And it was just like, yes, yes, fantastic. This just happened. He's going to be a, an English major. And he, and he did become one, even though he betrayed the discipline. He went into business. He I said, oh my gosh, he created his first compound sentence. I'm eating, comma, and drinking juice. So my, this lesson will end tomorrow with me saying to the Staples Motley students, all right, new game contestants, erase that sentence and now write me, attempt to write, not a one level sentence, not a two level sentence, try to write a three level sentence and try to begin the sentence with something other than a noun cluster. What many of you can do, I can see it, many bright students when they get to be in the latter end of adolescence, I've watched this for years, when they start figuring out that they can create, add one clause to another uh, to create apposition, here's what can happen, especially if they're bright and they've done a lot of reading, and you've got to watch this. It's not a warning, it's just an observation. The clusters can get long, right? Because the student learns that they can pile word under word under word. And as Shakespeare would say, sometimes their endings can forget their beginnings. Today's lesson, even though I took up 16 minutes with nothing to do with writing, is the, the trick of writing, the trick of good writing, is to keep the clusters short and balanced. And that ain't easy to do, and we're going to see it uh, again. We're going to come back to this idea in about a month, maybe five, six weeks, when we turn our attention to literature. Faulkner, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Thornton Wilder. Be well. See you soon. Journal entries are on the way. Try to get that A to Z paper done by uh, Wednesday night. Call, text, or email me if you have any questions.